Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ed Traeger. I'm going to talk today about Hari Punchai designing a Unicode compliant Titan font. What is Titan? Titan is a an Indic script. Uh, of Southeast Asia that features predominantly rounded letter forms and has traditionally been written on palm leaves, palm leaf manuscripts. Um, it's, um, the script is very closely related to modern Burmese, uh, the old Mon script, and all of these scripts are derived from the Palawa script, which itself is ultimately derived from the uh, Brahmi script of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, for centuries throughout the northern regions of Southeast Asia, in the Xishuangbanna region of Yunnan in China, in the Chan state of uh, Myanmar around the city of Qiangdong, uh, in parts of Lao, and in the Lana region of, Qingma, of uh, northern Thailand, around the cities of Chiang Mai and Lampun, um, the Taitam script has been used extensively to um, write uh, to preserve um, important cultural um, and religious uh, texts. Uh, and today, Thai Tam remains the um, only script used by the Thai Kun people of the Chan state in Myanmar. Um, in the other regions, um, in both Thailand, Lao, and, and in China, um, other scripts are now uh, predominant. So, for example, as we know, in, in Thailand, uh, Central Thai is, is used, and Lao, of course, the modern Lao script is used. But nevertheless, um, in Buddhist monasteries throughout the region, um, uh, Buddhist uh, novitiate monks um, still are, are learning uh, to read and write Thai Tam. So it's very much a living script. And um, in the digital era that we now live in, um, I think there's a renewed interest in preserving the cultural heritage of the past and educating the youth of the new generation. Um, and so naturally we see, um, as you would of course expect, um, the development of online resources uh, for Thai Tam and um, Thai Tam culture and um, And here are just a few examples. Uh, there's three, uh, you know, screenshots of three websites shown here. Digital Library of Lao Manuscripts, um, the Lana Manuscripts uh, site at the École Française d'Extrême Orient in, in Paris. Um, that middle one I want to point out in particular, that was, that's done in collaboration with the um, Princess Maha Dakri Sirinton Anthropology Center in Bangkok. And um, it's an important one because uh, there, I actually refer to that website quite often so that I would have access to uh, some palm leaf manuscripts in, written in Thai Tom so I could uh, do my research in developing this font. Um, and the, the uh, third one the front, in front here is uh, from Facebook. Um, there's a Lana Institute at uh, Chiang Mai Ratapat University. And some of the photographs later in the uh, presentation actually come from um, this Facebook page um, and I'm, I'm indebted to them because I'm, I'm not currently in Thailand so um, you know I wouldn't have had access to all these resources. Um, actually in fact if I was in Thailand I still wouldn't necessarily have access to the physical copies of uh, Lana manuscripts unless I ran all over the place so having all this stuff in a digital um, world is really convenient. Um, but what's missing? Well Unicode Titan fonts and Thai Titan input methods that actually work are missing. So if you go to the uh, Ecole Francaise website and you can search for documents, Titan documents, using either um, English, Latin script, or Central Thai script, but not, not Titan. So that's sort of like, can you imagine going to a library here in Germany and going to the card catalog and not being able to search the title of your book in Latin? I mean, that's a problem, right? So. Um, so clearly, uh, uh, more work is required before Titan really becomes available um, online. But it's not just an online problem. There are currently books being published in Thailand, um, and an example is shown here on the left using inferior uh, digital fonts. So on the left is a word circled in red, um, and below the base consonant there are two symbols that are just right on top of one another because 
uh, no one really thought enough or didn't work on the font long enough to, to think about uh, what's going to happen with the interaction of these uh, symbols that occur below uh, a base consonant. Um, on the right is my attempt in the Hare Punchai font to address those kinds of issues. And I'm not saying that's easy because you have to really think about what combinations of symbols occur, which means you have to know the language pretty well. And um, that's, that's not always easy for, um, to do. Um, so one solution we've seen in Thailand and elsewhere are, you know, this is a Thai Tom primer. Um, guess what? It's a handwritten manuscript. Uh, because if you write, if you reproduce a handwritten manuscript, there are no limitations, right? It's just it doesn't look quite as pretty, but there's no limitations in terms of um, shaping of your uh, text. Okay, so in this environment, then, I decided to try my hand at creating a Titan font. Uh, Hari Punchai is the old name for the city of Lampun, and that's where the name comes from. Uh, if we think about it, the... Um, materials and the tools that we use to uh, create letters uh, influence the shape of those letters. So if we were designing a Latin font, for example, ultimately serifs are an artifact of inscribing capital Latin letters in monumental stone. So if I was designing a Latin font, let's say a traditional Latin font, I might want to drive inspiration from Trajan's column, which is shown here, right? Likewise, if I'm going to design a Titan font, uh, now Titan doesn't have much of a typographic tradition. So if I was designing a Latin font, I could, I could probably skip Trajan's column and I could just say, no, let me look at what people have done since um, 300 AD, you know, and, and I could derive inspiration from that as well. But with Titan, there's not much of a typographic tradition, so it's been really important to look at the manuscript tradition. Let's look at how that works, because we're, as Westerners, we may not be very familiar with palm leaves. This I'm going to go very quickly. You cut these leaves from these giant palm trees um, in the genus Corypha, and the leaves are trimmed and boiled in a herbal mixture that has some insecticidal properties uh, because there's a lot of bugs in Southeast Asia. Trimmed, boom, there you go. Dried leaves ready to um, write on. And here are the styli that have needle tips that are used to inscribe the letters. Here's a monk in Thailand. This is from a contest, uh, a Thai Tom sort of writing contest for novitiate monks uh, held in Chiang Mai, I think it was in November of last year. Another photograph, just close up. These are from the Chiang Mai Ratapat Facebook website. And here you can see up close, but you can't see the letters yet because there's no ink. So the final stage is to wipe the leaves down with ink. So that's how it works. Finished folio. These are some great photographs. Um, and here you go. And then here you can see there's holes punched in the, um, in the leaves, and then they're strung together. So that's what the manuscripts look like. And that's what we're, we're using for inspiration to, deal, to draw, uh, create a font. Now, that's a great idea to go look at manuscripts, but the problem, you've got a lot of problems here. In the pre-modern era, there wasn't as much communication between regions, so you had, of course, development of regional variation. Here's just one letter form. This is a subjoined letter not uh, from manuscripts from three different cities in three different areas where the script is used, and you see this, it's looks really different. I mean, basic idea here is you're going to take, you're going to take your pen and you're going to kind of like draw a little loop and go to the right. But it depends how big is the loop and how much, how far, or not to the right, to the left. How much do you go to the left? So you, and it, in the end I decided on sort of the Chiang Mai style, which is the one at the bottom. Okay, Thai Tom is written very differently from, than from Latin. Um, you have base consonants that are surrounded by uh, subjoint consonants, uh, turn marks and uh, vowel signs. Uh, like some other scripts, uh, index scripts, things are, base consonants are generally written from left to right, but not always. So in the Unicode model, then, Unicode consortium chose a um, phonetic model, similar to like what was done for Devanagari. Uh, and so you would type uh, pa and then ra, 
to get the word plat, which means lord. But uh, that's what Unicode wants you to do. Uh, but people in Thailand, and um, they want to do it the other way around. They want to do visual ordering, because that's how you write it. They want to write ra first and then pa. So there's an input method issue here. Um, and um, Okay, let's go on. Um, Unicode also assigned a code point 1860 to called Sogot, which uh, allows you to type a subjoined consonant, which is a consonant that appears below another base consonant. Uh, in general, you see here the nga at the end of this word rakang um, appears below the, the ka. But, um, and it looks like just a sort of smaller, slightly more compact version. Uh, but sometimes the letters completely change shape, like the ma here. And what's complicated is 1825 there, it may appear in this changed form as shown in this slide, but not always. Sometimes it just looks like the regular little ma but in a smaller version. So there's a lot of complexity here. Vowel signs can appear anywhere around a base consonant. If they appear like the, um, the vowel A, which is shown before the got here, um, then you need support from a shaping engine such as Harf Buzz. This is also true for the medial rat that we saw earlier. You really need support from a shaping engine like Harf Buzz. And uh, basically, I designed my font to work with Harf Buzz. Does everyone know, do many people, how many people know when I'm harf buzz? Nah, yeah, okay, great. Okay, so putting all these things together, I circled a word here in the manuscript. It's um, sort of the word Buddha with all the honorifics, so it's praputa dao. And you can see a gloss in Latin on the right of the slide that sort of shows you the complexity here. But like anything else, you can learn to read and write this. It's not a problem, really. Okay. Now, let's look at uh, what I did. I, I mean, I wish I should have done something smart, like use Metopolator, but met, I, I didn't. Okay, so I used Inkscape, um, and the script, uh, this font is not, generally not modulated. Uh, the thickness of the strokes remains consistent, except for um, the head with the little red circle, and the tail sometimes narrows. So basically, I did uh, worked out my Bezier curves in Inkscape, um, like you see in black here. Um, and then for the tail, that was originally just a Bezier curve, not an outline. Then I can, in Inkscape, convert that to an outline, narrow it down to make the tail. Uh, that purple tail is useful for not only this letter, a dot, but also like another consonant, uh, not, and some of the other consonants. So um, then I could combine these, uh, create the union set of these pieces and I could get some um, glyphs. Uh, and another thing I liked in Inkscape is I could make a transparent or colored copy of a glyph and use that as a template to create additional glyphs. So in the end, I actually didn't do that much work on paper at all. Um, you know, because that would have been another option, right? Do some work on paper and bring that in as a background image. But I actually didn't do it that way. I just did it straight up on my digital canvas. Yeah, and here's another example. Um, where in Inkscape I could create uh, similar glyphs at the same time. So I've got 1A6D and two different possible versions of 1A3F in, a, in the subjoined or dependent form, um, along with, in purple, some finished glyphs so I can look side by side and just see how everything looked. So this is like the artist in me just like playing around on the digital canvas. So I mean, this worked great, except uh, when you create the union set, uh, of an outline in in um, in Inkscape, uh, you get more uh, points on the outline than you actually want. And then when I imported the stuff into FontForge, I'd get warnings that my points were too close together. So that's something I didn't like at all. It really bummed me out. But what can I do about it? Live with it. Okay, anyway, I had an online code repository. I could keep different versions of all these different uh, SVG files. It was great. I brought it, the work into FontForge. Uh, Dave Crossland has a little web page on um, his, um, uh, what's it called? I forget the name of his website. It's in the speaker notes. Um, that shows you how you can import your um, SVGs into FontForge. I guess a lot of people here probably know how to do that. Okay, anchor points. Obviously, with all these... Um, how much time do I have? Three minutes. Okay. Yeah. Obviously, with um, all these symbols that go around, I need a lot of anchor points. 
Um, so originally I had a, a small set of anchor points, but then I said, no, no, I need more flexibility, more control. So I have a, created a set of 10, I think 10 or 12, 10 anchor points. Um, so then initially in FontForge, I chose a few base letters, such as the cot shown here. And in the graphical user, user interface, positioned my anchor points, and then used within FontForge, made sure that everything looked correct when I placed symbols around it. And then, this is where open source is nice, the FontForge font, font spline database is just a text file, thank God. So I was able to go out to you know, my command line in Vim, basically copy and paste my list of anchor points from that base consonant cot to all of its sort of cousin consonants that look sort of the same. And then go back into the graphical user interface and say, okay, this is almost right, but not quite, and do little tweaks, but you know, not have to do everything in the graphical user interface. Thank God, because I'm really a lot of a, I'm sort of a command line person. Um, unless I'm drawing on paper, then, I, then I'm an art person. Uh, correct shaping. So finally, I had two platforms to work with. Basically, HarfBuzz includes a tool called uh, HB-View, and then HarfBuzz is now included in Firefox or the nightly build version of Firefox called Aurora, and I use that. And then I have, um, there's um, a sort of online multilingual um, editor that I created called Key Curry. It's at my website, unifont.org slash keycurry, that I use for typing stuff. So finally, by December, um, I had some time around the holidays. I was working on this font a lot, and I get good shaping, you know, correct shaping, correct layout, no problems. But then the day after Christmas, uh-oh, the dreaded dotted circle. If any of you have ever worked with complex uh, scripts like Arabic or index scripts, you'll know this is terrible. So I was like, ah, what am I doing? What, what's gone wrong? Did I do something wrong? I wrote an email to the HarfBiz mailing list and I said, you know, can someone please give me a hint about uh, is something changed in HarfBuzz? Did I do something wrong with my font? Please help me. I got an email back from Martin Hoskin. He wrote, the answer is simple but insidious. The normalization for Titom is broken. I have tried very hard to get the Unicode technical committee to fix this, but they refuse. Based on stability principles, they're like, no, we know it's wrong, but we can't change it because we have a stability pol policy. So that was not good news. But then uh, Jonathan Q, who does a lot of work for Mozilla, came up with a very simple patch uh, for HarfBuzz, which changes the combining class of the Sogot character 1060 so that it has a lower priority than the tone marks or the vowel signs that uh, precede it. So you don't get the random reordering that was calling, causing the dotted circle. So thank you, Jonathan, thank you. <laughs> this is how work gets fixed in the open source world. And I think an interesting story that we're seeing here, if you think about it, is there's this chicken and egg problem where on the one hand, the developers of HarfBuzz, like Bedad Esfavod and Jonathan Q and these other guys are, of course they're including code in HarfBuzz to provide correct shaping for Titom and other Indic and Indic derived scripts. But until you have an actual Unicode font to play with, and that's where like Hari Punshai comes into play, you don't know whether it's going to really work or not. So then, so then I'm designing a font, and I don't know if my font's going to work either until I play around with it in HarfBuzz. So it's very much a chicken and egg problem. But in the open source world, you know, we get things done in a very short time. If you think about it, this was like just December. So by February, uh, Aurora, which is f the nightly build of Firefox, already had the patch included. So boom, everything works. Okay, so then I'm basically done with my talk. Do I have any time left or not? No. Some pretty pictures. So while Lorraine comes up uh, to the front, uh, we have time for maybe one question. What would? Yes, question. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Oh, I just put it in here. Yes, I mean, ah, yeah, Have you ever considered 
comparing your phone to Georgian. It's, okay. it's a question. It's a question for you. Have you have you ever uh, considered comparing your phone to Georgian fonts? Yes, like um, on the surface, uh, uh, the Titan looks very similar to a Georgian Mbretuli script. Uh, yeah, Eric? well, no, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the answer. She hasn't. Yeah, I haven't. No, I haven't. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs>